we begin our, fir- our final series in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the first, yeah, this is the first big chunk of teaching that Jesus gives in the book of Matthew, and so far we've learned quite a bit, right? We see uh, Jesus calling us to faith in him, we see him sort of walking through these blessings that he bestows on us when we're in him, he raises the ethical standard that he calls us to. He walks us through prayer, what that looks like. How do we do that? He helps us to see God as Heavenly Father, which is something that's sort of new that he introduces and brings to the table. There's a lot going on. That's why it's taken us you know, half a year to get through these three chapters. Uh, but the last section here is an interesting one because the beginning of the sermon starts with blessings. The end of the sermon... Jesus gives warnings. It's all part of the same sermon, so you can't disconnect one from the other. And that's sort of the danger of reading the Bible as, you know, as verses instead of as paragraphs. Because what comes before any given sentence informs what that sentence means. And so you can't strip out the warnings and be like, well, this is the Jesus that I like that's just coming in and cracking skulls. Like, that's my Jesus. And someone else be like, well, I really like the blessings. Like, that's the Jesus I like. Before long, it turns into that, like, dinner table scene from Talladega Nights where, you know, he's like, well, I like to pray to baby Jesus. That's just my favorite Jesus. Like, you can't do that. The Jesus isn't a superhero. There's not like, well, I prefer Golden Age Captain America. or whatever. It's like, you can't, you got to take the whole thing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, much less the same in the middle of the same sermon. It'd be weird if I was just a completely different person at the end of this message than I am right now. And so we can't ignore the warnings and just think about the blessings, and we can't ignore the blessings and just think about the warnings. We've got to take these all together. We've got to balance them just the way that Jesus balances them here. And so the rest of the sermon, we've seen grace and mercy all throughout it, even while he's raising the bar and calling us to this higher standard. And that's not to say that they're absent here, but they're not pulled to the forefront uh, like they are in the rest of the sermon. This is a little more divisive in the case of today's passage, literally so. And so what you'll notice is that each of these warnings is centered around a dichotomy. There's a set of two, there's a pair, one positive, one negative, that Jesus is pointing to here. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to take a look at these warnings, see what they have to teach us, and what they're warning us from, right? It's important to Jesus, if he's going to warn us about something, we should probably know what that warning is, right? Uh, It's like, you know, going to a foreign country, uh, especially going somewhere where the language is like completely unfamiliar to you, right? Because I took four years of French in high school, don't know a ton, but if I'm reading it, I can get by pretty well. Um, I can understand some things that people say to me sometimes, but it'll like sound like a delay or something. It's like we're talking over an old dial-up connection or something like that. It's like, oh right, yeah, yeah, that. Um, so we had some funny stories from some time that we, you know, we were in France. But if I go somewhere Spanish or Italian language, like I can sort of navigate that pretty well, because all the words are pretty much the same, things like that. It's the same airport, or the same uh, like, like words for things, you know, like airport in English, well, it's aeroport in France, so it's like, well, that's pretty easy to figure out. But then you go to somewhere like Germany, or I was in Copenhagen for a night once, and the alphabet there is crazy. And you look at it, and you're like, there's no like, oh, airport, airport, got it. What's airport over there? What's Lufthansa? Oh, yeah, of course. (laughs) And so you're walking through Lufthansa, and you see a sign. It's got, it's red, it's got an exclamation mark, and then some gibberish that you don't know what it says after that. It'd be helpful to know what that sign is telling you not to do, right? You want to know what that warning is all about. And so if Jesus is going to give us warnings, we got to know what he's warning us not to do so that we don't do those things. And so let's dive into the first one here. It's in Matthew chapter 7. We'll start in verse 13. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, 
For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. But the, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so he's talking about gates and roads. We're going to focus on the gates here first. There's a wide gate, a narrow gate. There's a easy road, there's a hard road. But we'll start with the, the gate part here. Jesus tells us, enter through the narrow gate, not through the wide gate. Now, the good gate being narrow, it doesn't necessarily, it's not talking about it being tiny and so, you know, it's hard to get people into the gate, like it's hard to funnel them in. That's not necessarily what he's talking about here. As one pastor once said, sort of describing his drive for evangelism, was like, sure, it's a narrow gate, but you can make a long line, right? Like, <laughs> you can get a lot of people through it. That's n- he's not necessarily saying the gate itself is hard to get through, that it's keeping people from getting in. The gate being narrow, what that means is that it's a lot harder to see. You might not notice that gate. You could look past that gate pretty easily. People are walking right by it, and they don't even know it. Which makes me sort of think of like speakeasies, right? Like back in Prohibition, there were all of those bars that sort of popped up in like back rooms and behind gates and things like that, where you know you had to speak easy, you couldn't say it out in public because they're in there drinking bathtub gin or whatever it was. And, uh, and so now there are like modern bars that have sort of adopted this aesthetic because like, hey, it's just kind of cool. Like we don't need to do this, but it's fun. And so there's like, there's one in Philadelphia that you go by and it's in the middle of Chinatown. It's right across the street from one of the big concert venues down there. But if you're walking up to it, it's just an unmarked black gate with a buzzer and an intercom. And that's it. And so it shows up on all these lists whenever, you know, Philly Mag or whoever makes them like, oh, this is the top 10 bars in Philadelphia or whatever. It's always there. And I'm sure there are people that are walking by like, where is this place? Like, all I see is like what looks, I can only assume like the, you know, the place from like hostel where they're going to torture you and murder you in here or something like that. Like, there's nothing, no markings. And it just looks like a warehouse. Like, what is this? And so sometimes like the best things, they're unmarked, it's hard to see. That's kind of what Jesus is getting at with the narrow gate here, is that you might miss it, you might walk by it, you wouldn't necessarily think about it. It's inconspicuous, it's unassuming. And so what is the gate exactly? Like in the metaphor, it's Jesus, right? Jesus is the gate. So he's also making a claim about truth here. He's saying he's the only way. And he says this in other places too, right? In John, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he's making a bold claim. You might even call him narrow-minded. See what I did there? Ah. And so it's, it's frowned upon to say, well, you can't say only one religion is the only way. Like, that's not cool. You say Jesus or nothing, and you... You're going to offend people. You're going to ruffle some feathers. It's awfully presumptuous of you to say that there's only one true religion. How how could you say something like that? It's whatever's true for you. And people will, with a straight face, tell you all the religions, they're basically, they teach the same things. So it's wrong to claim that one is truer than any other one. They're all just all equally true. Which is like people say that totally ignorant of the fact that you're making a statement about the truth of religion. So why do you get to have opinions and no one else does? Like, (laughs) what's that all about? But here's the thing is that all religions do not teach the same thing, and they do not serve the same God. You can tell that, say, Christianity and Islam worship different gods because they describe him in completely different ways, right? Think about it like this. If you were talking to someone and you asked if they knew me, and they were like, oh, Jeremy, yeah, he's the pastor at Lakeside, Adrian's his wife, yeah, they like, like to make food, they're big fight fans, you'd be like, cool, this guy knows Jeremy. But then if you talk to someone else, and they're like, oh, Jeremy, yeah, I know he's an astronaut, wears a cowboy hat. You'd be like, hmm, I think we're talking about different people here. <laughs> One of these fellows is confused. They're not describing the same person, and I think that's the same thing. Is it all really, they don't, they're not the same. They're not equally worthy. They don't all get you to the same place. This is why Jesus describes this gate as narrow. There's only one answer. It's him or nothing. 
And so the only way that somebody can walk the path to life, you've got to go through him. Every other gate, it's actually the same gate, and they all lead to the same place. And Jesus calls that place destruction. And so I suppose in some sense, all of the religions except for Christianity do get you to the same place. Nowhere. And it's only through Jesus that we get to walk that road to life. It's like an amusement park. Like you've got all the turnstiles, right? With the little like spinny thing that's never tall enough for someone my size, right? And you go through, you know, they all seem like different gates. They all go to the same place. And then Jesus is like this side door. It's like, you don't want to go to that park. Trust me. He's an escape hatch. He's calling us all to go through his door and live. And now it's important to note here that Jesus isn't just calling people to good behavior. He's not calling people to, oh, we'll just clean up your image and do these good things. He's calling us to faith in him. The gate, this is an evangelical decision. That you are making the decision to put your faith in Jesus. To put your trust in him. To rely on him for salvation. Jesus says that few people are going to find the narrow gate as opposed to many who are going to find the wide gate. When I was going back to Cleveland for the Cavs championship parade back in June, I was using Waze for my GPS. It's an app on your phone uh, that is the best. It's great. And what it does is it routes you around traffic in real time. So if you're going to hit a traffic jam or something, it'll say, hey, we got a better way. Go this way. You'll miss all the traffic. By and large, it's wonderful. And we're going, and I get to Chicago, and it's like, don't keep going down the same highway that you always go down. Get off this weird exit. It was like, well, why would I get off this weird exit? Everybody's going this way. And then I look ahead and see just a parking lot ahead of me where just everyone has stopped. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to get off. And I, so I get off. It, like, takes me this wacky way that just, I, like, completely missed everything. Like, it just routed me right around the traffic, put me back on the highway. I was good. I lost, like, maybe a minute tops. Just like, wait, killing it. Everybody else was on the road to destruction or, or traffic, which is the same thing, really. And I lived on. I kept going. When I go to uh, Cedar Points Amusement Park in Ohio, best amusement park in the world for many years running, uh, 16 years in a row, Golden Ticket Award, best amusement park in the world, so this isn't just me being a homer. It's the best. Uh, it's de been dethroned the past couple of years by Europa Park in Rust, Germany. I don't know what that's all about, but I'm going to have to go and get to the bottom of this. But one of the worst things about going to an amusement park is parking, right? It's like getting there and finding a parking spot. And like Disney World, if you've ever been, is the worst about this. Because they're like, what if, instead of building parking garages, we just put out miles of parking and made people walk here? <laughs> like, like, great. Awesome job, Walt. <laughs> but Cedar Point, there's, there's the entrance that everybody goes into to their parking. But then there's a back way, which is hard to do because it's on a peninsula. But there's still a back way that you can take. You can go around the other side, and nine times out of ten, not only do you get in quicker, you get like a way closer spot than everybody else does. And so not many people do this, so why it works so well. You wouldn't think, like, you're on a peninsula, you have to cross a bridge to get there. There's still a back way, <laughs> and it works. So everybody goes one way, we would go another and it always worked out. It was always great. And Jesus is sort of setting up this dichotomy, like, everybody's going this way. Are you going to go that way, or are you going to go this way? Are you going to go this different way? Are you going to take this narrow gate, this path that leads to life? And what he's telling us here is that we're always going to be different. Like, if you're following Jesus, you're always going to be the minority. You always will. There's nothing we can do about that. There's no way that we can make Jesus cool or hip enough that everybody's going to jump on board. It's not going to happen. He says, look, there are going to be few that choose the narrow gate. There are going to be many that choose the wide gate. Now, I wasn't a math major, but many is always bigger than few. We're always going to be the underdogs. We're always going to be in the minority. And we've got to decide as the church to be okay with that. And act accordingly. 
we can't expect that everybody's going to agree with us, that we're going to be able to rely on popular opinion being on our side all the time. We won't have it, and we never will. We're always going to be the few. And so Jesus is saying, go against what everybody else is after. Be different. Pick the narrow gate. And so he talks about gates, and then he talks about roads. You go through the gate to get to the road seems to be the best way to read what he's saying here. So in the gate, down the road. And the road you enter from the wide gate is easy too. It's spacious. It's big. you got a whole lot of room to move around. I think it's a great illustration of sort of that anything goes mentality, right? Like whatever you want to do, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, is a-okay. Go for it. Knock yourself out. We're on the wide road. You just do whatever. Great. And that may make a certain amount of sense in terms of like human government and things like that. That's not what Jesus calls us to as followers of him at all. The wide road says, hey, follow your heart. Do whatever you want. The wide road puts usefulness and effectiveness ahead of character. And Jesus goes, no, that's not what we're doing here. That's not what we're all about. It is a much harder road to have convictions and live by them. To have a code that you stick to. To have lines that you won't cross. Wide road, don't have time for that. Anything goes. Well, on the wide road. When you're trying to teach your child how to drive, where do you take them first? The very first thing to get this going. You go to an empty parking lot, right? Because in an empty parking lot, you don't have to worry about staying in the lines. You don't have to worry about any of that. Anything goes. It's an empty parking lot. You just drive wherever you want. And you usually end up driving wherever they want. It's easy. But on the opposite end of that, you can think about like a really narrow street. D.C. had some of these. I think the most extreme is when I was in England in high school for a mission trip. And we'd be on these streets that it's like you felt like you kind of had to stop and like turn your mirrors in just to get down without hitting the cars parked on both sides. It's a lot harder to drive on the narrow road because there's no room for error there. Pedestrian jumps out, someone opens their car door like bad news bears. And so Jesus is saying, go down the narrow road. The gates an evangelical decision. The road is ethical endurance. You stay on the road. He's, Jesus isn't just calling us, say some words and then we're good here. So you live a radically different life. Like go through the gate and then keep living in a way that upholds that. It's not enough to just go, yeah, I believe that, and then walk away completely unchanged. Jesus sets the bar pretty high for us in this sermon, and here he's calling us again to try to meet it. The whole Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing. Jesus is giving us a picture of what the narrow road looks like. Who are the people that walk these roads? Well, they're the least likely. These are the people you would least expect to walk and any sort of special road, right? They're the poor in spirit. They're the mourners. They're the meek. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're the merciful. They're pure in heart. The peacemakers, the persecuted, those are the kinds of people that are walking this road. Well, what are they like? What do they do? You picture someone looking from the outside in. Like, well, who are these people? How do they live? Well, they don't hold bitterness or resentment against other people. They stay faithful in their marriages, even in their thoughts. And those marriages like stick together. These people, they're always honest. They don't just love the people that love them. They even love their enemies. They do good and they don't make a show out of it. You'd hardly even notice it sometimes. They care more about eternity than they do the here and now. They're carefree. They trust God like a father. They forgive people. They give them second chances. They treat people the way they would want to be treated, and like actively, not just passively, but they actively try to treat people well. Who are these people? It's a difficult path to walk. Make no mistake about it. But the only way that we're able to walk this path is because Jesus is leading us. He's walked at first, and we're walking behind him. Pam was telling me the other day about you know, this trip to a cave that she took where it was just like head down, follow the person in front of you, hope the cave crickets don't consume your face like, and just keep going, right? It's kind of the same thing, just like, all right, we're just sticking on this path. I was in Northern Ireland on a mission trip a few years ago. 
when we went to the Antrim coast and like Giant's Causeway and all that. It was just awesome. So you're on all these like cliffs and the grass there, I could really only describe it as like billowy. <laughs> it's just really long and it looks like a comb over and it's just kind of all there. And we've got this guy who's with the church, uh, this guy Norman who's showing us around. Norman's the man. And he's grabbing me and a couple other guys and he's like, hey, come down here with me. And so we're going down these slopes and stuff and you're like, you'll stop and it's just, you're on a cliff and then there's this incredible view of the ocean and you know everything that's going on there. You're like, man, this is awesome. Well, then you realize you got to get back up. And so you turn around and it's just, you're just looking at a wall of grass. And you're like, um, so <laughs> we got here. How do we get back up there? And no joke, Norman just like, no big deal, just goes over and starts grabbing handfuls of grass and is just pulling himself up the grass and climbs up this thing. I don't know about you, my first thought was like, we're going to climb grass? Like, I, this seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> like, how's grass going to hold your weight? How are you going to climb grass? Like, no one climbs grass. Like, what is going on here? And so, Norman did it. Norman's a much bigger guy than I am. I was like, all right, here we go. <laughs> Grab some grass. Boom. Just scurried right up it. No problem. The only way I was going to try that was because I saw Norman did it first. I was like, all right. He set the tone, he set the path, he did this first. All right, he let I'll follow. That's the only way I'm getting off of this cliff, so hope it works. The only way we're able to walk this narrow path is because Jesus is leading the way. We keep our eyes on him and we follow his lead, we'll make it. And I think, too, about the narrow path as sort of, let's talk about real, real narrow paths. It's kind of like walking a tightrope, right? You're kind of walking, and we're on this tightrope, but there's this safety net of grace that's there to catch us if we fall. That Look, we're not going to walk this road perfectly. We're going to fall off the path. We're going to get mixed up. It's going to happen. And it drives us back to those blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the ones who really aren't doing such a great job of walking this path. What separates us is we've chosen the narrow gate, we've chosen the narrow road, and we're determined to walk that path. It doesn't matter what happens, we're staying on that path. And so even if we fall, we're caught and we're put back on and we keep going. We want to walk this path. This is where we want to be. This is how we want to live. No matter how many times it means falling off, we get back up and we keep going. And so ultimately, Jesus is forcing his listeners, and by extension, us, to make a decision. You have to choose. Wide gate, narrow gate. What's it going to be? Because this decision has eternal consequences, right? You're getting whatever's at the end of this road that you're on. So if you choose the narrow road, the narrow gate, the destination is life. You choose the wide gate, the wide road, the destination is distraction. Jesus doesn't mince words. He doesn't soften this. He doesn't try to wrap it up neatly and caveat it all to pieces. He doesn't do that. He doesn't think this is relative. Like, ah, oh, whatever you think. He doesn't leave it up to his listeners to determine their truth. He doesn't present this as one of a number of valid choices that you could make. He doesn't do that. He goes, this is one or the other. Which are you going to pick? It's literally a life or death decision. Are you going to pick the narrow road? Or are you going to pick the wide road? What's it going to be? Choosing life means choosing the narrow gate. It means putting your faith in Jesus. That he died and rose from the dead. That he paid the price for your sins. That you accept his sacrifice and his righteousness, and you don't trust or lean on your own. And then it means walking the narrow road. It means obeying his commands, seeking to honor him with your life, making him your number one priority. Choosing death, that's easy. Just do nothing. You're done. 
think good thoughts about Jesus, but don't seek to actually serve Him or anything. Just kind of, yeah, it's good stuff. Want Him to answer your prayer, but, you know, not be the ruler of your life. And so this is the decision that Jesus puts in front of His disciples back then. It's the same decision that He puts in front of every single one of us today. What will you choose? What's it going to be? Narrow gate or the wide gate? Life or death? Choose wisely. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that You have extended to us this generous gift of salvation. And that if we choose You, this narrow gate, this narrow road, if we put our faith in You, our trust in You, we rely on You for our salvation, that You will not let us down that we will receive the righteousness that You earned. That we will have life at the end of the road. That we will have the reward that You've promised for us. That we will have You. Lord, give us the faith to choose well to choose You, to put You first, to make You our priority. Thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen.